Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. And another lovely morning. Oh, it's the 1st of June. And the sky is clear. At least until all the contrails from the planes expand and cover it up. And uh, <clears throat> do you know what? The, the best time to sunbathe is about half past seven around here because by about half past eight the clouds come over but at seven o'clock it's the sky is totally clear and the sun is starting to get really hot and I could literally do an hour's worth of sunbathing from about seven till eight mm. yeah seven till eight and then go to work so I might seriously consider that I'm getting to be seriously addicted to getting my vitamin D from the sun rather than from pills anyway how are you all right I hope you're well I am well I'm in a good mood I uh, had another bank holiday haven't we this week so it's another short week only four days June we did a we did a bit of a survey to find out how many patients we had in each month last year and I was quite surprised to find that June was our busiest month and in fact that has played out this year because I'm I'm booked up solid two weeks ahead which is unusual you know we're getting lots of new patients in let me have a think I don't think we've had anything particularly interesting oh having gone on yesterday about the stupidity of the uh, having to prescribe people Valium instead of you know which doesn't clear out of your system for three days as opposed to uh, Tamazepam, which is out of your system in five hours. I'd just like to say that uh, it all went very well yesterday. The pre -med Valium pre-medication worked quite well. She was obviously a bit dopey when she came in. When I asked her, she said she'd had three tablets. So that's 30 milligrams of Valium. So I mean, that's enough to sedate anybody, isn't it? Came in with two of her mates who were looking after her. So all in all, happy days. The, uh, she was fine. I think the Valium sort of just taking the edge off it, you know. She was, I said to her, at worst, she was her worst enemy. I always say to these patients, I'll, I'll be fine, the job will be fine, it's you, you know. All, 100% of it boils down to how much of a lunatic you are on the day. And uh, if you tell the patient that that's the expectation is on them, really, just to behave themselves and you're getting through it, then, then usually it's okay. If they're physically not capable of, uh, you know, behaving themselves, then obviously they're a case for either proper sedation. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't say proper sedation. I'd say either no treatment or anaesthetic. You know, knock them out, give them a quick a GA, and do the treatment because uh, we have got some patients who are properly phobic. I would say at least one or two of them, and. They, um, you know, the practice in the past has attempted to treat them under sedation. I haven't myself personally, but I know the practice certainly before I bought it, they did just routinely treat a, a lot of patients under sedation. And um, it doesn't really solve anything, in my opinion. It sort of, it just makes it twice or three times as difficult to do the treatment. And it just about gets the patient over the ledge you know into onto the point where they're happy enough to come in for another appointment they are they are off their tits on anesthetic and you're never completely sure whether that's what they want you know when they ring up and they say oh yeah I decided to come in again and get this other thing done you know they're basically they're just coming in to be you know for a load of drugs <laughs> they couldn't buy over the counter I'm very suspicious about that. I'm not, you know, I mean, you, you turn uh, the dentistry into a not unpleasant experience for someone by pumping them full of uh, narcotics, quasar narcotics, and you know, that's there's a certain type of personality that will never come off it, if that's the whole point. You know, I mean, they'll not, I'm not saying they're drug addicts or anything, I'm just saying that that's, they will think, oh, I don't mind that, you know, 
and and so any suggestion then that you know you might want to ramp the dose down a bit next time or uh, you know possibly have a try on something simple without any uh, oh no 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 so we've certainly done a lot less under sedation since I bought the practice um, and we've done <coughs> our OPG machine packed up well it didn't it didn't pack up it's quite an old machine and it was uh, always had a it was designed to take a plate you know a chemical plate and then it was retrofitted with a some gadgetry to give it the ability to take digital x-rays and um, that went fut shortly after I bought it and the, the owner didn't really know how to repair it and he's he's sort of a bit, he's sort of you know well you know <laughs> he there's a standard when you buy a practice you sign, you sign a standard form that says um, you know, I buy the place as it is, you know, that I have fully inspected all the equipment and I've satisfied that I know exactly what sort of state it's in and uh, I'm not going to come back afterwards and say, well, uh, you know, I bought it on the assumption that it was in this order and it wasn't, it was in that order and therefore you've, you've deadled me. Um, and then um, just before the, uh, the sale, I got this form again from East Lister, and he says, Lister, uh, my sister said, oh, we've had this form, just, you've got to sign it to say that, you know, your site completely seen, site seen, you know, caveat emptor, and uh, you're totally happy with what you're buying, and the fact that we got it twice, and the fact that we got it just before the, what I signed on the dotted line, alerted me to the fact that all was not as it seemed at this practice, you know, that, that was superficially everything had been kept working while I was there, uh, that the owner knew that, uh, then, uh, and obviously he's got, uh, there's an asymmetry there isn't, in the knowledge that he's got, he's got the knowledge that something's not working or he's prone to breaking down or is, is likely to need replacing. So anyway, but uh, you know, <coughs> I was very much of the opinion that as long as I've got a one working chair out of three and a receptionist, I could bring my own computer in and we can do some dentistry, you know. As it turned out, the, the major sort of structural problems were some leaking underneath the floor in the pipes and um, this OPG that blew up on day two. So, we're sending uh, wisdom teeth off for extraction somewhere else you know into secondary care and this is a long and unhappy story it dates right back to my first days postgraduate in 1982 1983 and uh, where I was you know felt that I'd been trained to take out wisdom teeth and we had an OPG machine in the practice I was working as an associate and um, quite happily taking out wisdom teeth and um, I had a complaint uh, to the uh, Family Health Services Authority, which was the sort of the quasi commissioning authority at the time. And uh, from this woman, a young woman, she must have been in her mid 20s or something, and said that she'd um, had a lot of uh, pain and suffering. You know, I'd taken a wisdom tooth out for, and it had been 100, and, you know, 11 out of 10 on the pain scale afterwards, and she'd had to not been able to sleep, and she'd been taking every maximum dose of every painkiller under the sun sort of a, a real sort of a typical what I know now is a typical hyperbolic complaint and uh, not that I'm, I'm not saying that you know people who have wisdom teeth out don't have any pain and suffering but it was just a, and also she she never mentioned it I never heard anything I took the wisdom tooth out that was the last I heard of it she never came back she never told me she'd had any post-operative pain or gave me a chance to look for a dry socket or prescribe her some prescription painkillers that might have helped her through the first week or you know at least or even indicated to her that I was at least sympathetic to her plight which might have reduced the chances of her putting in a formal complaint so anyway like two months or three months later just get this formal complaint through so it goes to what they call a service committee and I was pretty happy you know my notes were good I had a pre-operative OPG uh, she'd had no numbness, no no tingling or, or, or uh, paresthesia or anesthesia of the nerves. So I mean, you know, I mean, this was simply just 
obviously quite a unpleasant wisdom tooth extraction for her, but one one which in the fullness of time would would be fine. And um, one of the uh, the uh, I think the service committees in those days had a chairman and a lay person and a dentist, and the chairman was almost always a lawyer because the um, idea was that the lawyer was there to you know could keep the committee straight on the legal side of things and the layperson was literally supposed to be like just a patient a representative of the patient body and the dentist was usually someone off the local dental committee and I uh, uh, I had a guy called Ashley Lupin who was a local dentist in, and still is in Chatham around the sort of Chatham Medway Towns area and uh, I'll never forget old Ashley Lupin. He, he held the old APG up to the light, and he said, uh, "He said this is quite a tricky, uh, you know, you, you've only been qualified like 18 months. This is quite a tricky uh, third molar to take out, isn't it?" And I said, "Well, no, I felt it was within my capability, blah blah blah, which I did, and well, you know, had been proved correct." And uh, he said, "Well, what about all this bone? Oh, there's a lot of bone," he said, "overlying the tooth." And I asked to see the x-ray, and I could see what he was looking at, and it was the external oblique ridge, which is a, just a radiographic feature on the mandible that does not indicate that there's any bone <laughs> overlying the, the, the wisdom tooth. It looks, it sometimes looks like a, a load of bone that might over the top of the tooth, but the bone is not. But due to the flattening effect, the 2D effect of the uh, OPG, it's, uh, it's a, artificial illusion you know it's an artifact and we'd been trained at the hospital to we knew we knew the anatomy of the mandible you know it was the, it's, it's the oblique ridge so um, I, I was in a very very difficult position because I thought right this guy's a senior practitioner and he's committed a basic error something that a student will be picked up on straight away and what do I do what do I do I say to him excuse me but that's the external oblique ridge. I think you've made a, a complete noob mistake there. Uh, or you know, or what do I do? I just ignore it and sort of let it, let it, you know, go. And I did the wrong thing. I just decided to, you know, and I, you know, it's just my personality. I'm like, you know, you come across stupidity. You come across an idiot, and, and 99 times out of 100, it's easier just to let it go. So I should have said something, and. But I just said no. I said, I, in my opinion, and I was there at the time, that there was not an excessive amount of bone overlying this tooth. And anyway, what they did was they uh, found that I'd um, tackled a tooth that was beyond my skill, and that uh, as a result the patient had suffered a lot. So they found me in breach of my terms of service. This was like as a newly qualified. Oh, I was like qualified about 18 months and I'd already been found in breach of my terms of service. I was obviously a badden, you know, I mean, Jesus Christ. They, they, when you look at some of the baddens now, I was an angel. I was an angel. I was my only, my only, oh, you know, I'd, I'd done nothing wrong and and yet I'd, and I'd been do, doing my best for the patient and the patient hadn't given me a chance to remediate any problems that she might have had and I'd been found in breach of my terms of service. And on that, on that day, in 1982 or whatever, I vowed I would never ever take another wisdom tooth out. And I've kept that vow. I have kept that vow. Because I wanted to put the NHS to as much trouble as, I've, as they've put me. So, and over the years, I could have taken out thousands of wisdom teeth and helped the NHS out. But I've referred them all into secondary care and it's probably cost them millions and too fucking right. That's what you get when you don't treat me right. I don't treat you right either. So anyway, you can tell how, how annoyed I was about it, can't you? So anyway, I'm referring wisdom teeth to the local hospital because now I just, no, I can't be. It's not worth the risk. Do you know what I mean? That's why I did it. It wasn't like out of uh, peak or anything. There, there was, there was a rationale behind this, and the rationale was behind that if you train, if you're good at your job, if you know your job and you do a good job, 
and you get found in breach of your terms of service, then what's the point? What is the point? You know, if, if the people who are in charge of weeding out the bad eggs don't protect you when you need protecting, then you're on your own, aren't you? You really, you can't rely on any help or assistance. So I'm referring uh, wisdom teeth off, and now in Kent they've got this online system for referring wisdom teeth, and it's hopeless. And yesterday I logged online and I found that the last three uh, referrals I've sent off have been referred back. And the reason they've been referred back is because there's no OPG. So the OPG seemed to be done like, you know, when, when I, a few years ago, you know, you didn't want to do an OPG. You were told, no, it's a big dose of radiation and you, you shouldn't even do it. Not, not for assessment purposes. You should only do it if you think that you might take some action as a result. But now, no, everybody has an OPG before breakfast. So, um, but my, my point yesterday was this. this is the, these guys, they've got a surgical contract from the National Health Service to take out wisdom teeth. And they're turning back referrals on the grounds that they don't have an APG. And my question to them today is why don't you have an OPG? Right? Why do you expect every single dentist who sends you a patient to have an OPG? And if they don't have an, you know, if the referring dentist doesn't have an OPG machine, which we do, but it's out of commission, and I, I'm not going to spend the fortune it's going to cost to recommission it for the odd, so that I can take x rays for another practice free of charge. Why, why do you, why, how on earth did they get that surgical contract without having an OPG machine? What did they put in their application? Yeah, 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 we take out difficult wisdom teeth, but we, we haven't, we're not asked to get an OPG machine. You know, someone else can do that. We're like, we're serious about taking out wisdom teeth, but we're not serious about, and serious enough to get an OPG machine. Fortunately, there's a walk-in uh, service at the local hospital. So now what we have to do is we have to write a letter to the patient, ask them to go to the local hospital, have an OPG, bring the disc back to us, we then put it in our computer, uh, digitise it, and then attach it to the electronic referral, which then goes off to the the practice, and then hopefully they um, and then they uh, and they they uh, oh, they then contact the patient, right? And then they say to the patient, if, <laughs> they say to the patient, would you do you think you're going to need to be sedated for this? And the patient says, well, I don't know, I might be. And then they turn it down again, because we don't do sedation. All right. <laughs> I'm going to be pleased to get into the stress of work. The stress of work is going to be less than the stress of driving here at this rate. Okay, see you soon, bye.